Okay, hi P4. Here we are, week twelve since uh, the classrooms have closed, and uh, we're starting a brand new week. So, um, yesterday we had ground, and when it comes to the literacy pack, today we've got. Uh, oh, and then we had science, and today we've got history. So history, we're going back to the Silk Road. We're going to have a little bit of a chat about a gentleman called Marco Polo. He was an explorer from Italy, and he was one of, or maybe even, the very first uh, European explorer to make it all the way over to China and all the way back, and he used the Silk Road that was operating at the time. Now, as I mentioned before, uh, a couple of weeks ago, traders used to travel parts of the Silk Road, so a little bit here, and then they went back, and then the next trader would take the goods to the next point, maybe to the next city, trade there, and so on and so forth. So they kept exchanging goods as, as they went along. Very few travellers travelled the entire distance along the Silk Road. Marco Polo was one of those people. So moving along, as you can see, he lived between 1254 and 1324, many years ago. Um, he was from a place called Venice, which is still there, a city in Italy. And um, he wrote about all his travels in a book called The Travels of Marco Polo. And that's important too, because some people might have made the journey, but we just don't have any, any records of that. So moving along, um, so Marco Polo, his mother died when he was very young. Um, his father and uncle were both merchants, so they were traders. They, they were very much into trading and therefore a little bit of travelling as well. And um, at one point when he returned home after travelling with some traders, he found out his wife had died and he only had his son with him. Um, so they decided, uh, so he, he and the two men decided it would be great to, to try to travel all the way to China and do some trade and learn about uh, about the Chinese. Remember at the time, China was kind of a legendary. Nobody really knew anything about it. It was like a mystical, magical land. So moving on, he left his home in 1271. And as we discussed, it took him four years of walking to reach China. So when he went to China, he traveled on the Land Silk Road. Now, remember, again, the Silk Road isn't just one road. There are many different little paths and, and routes and, and different ways of getting along there. But essentially, it was a way of traveling from Europe through to Asia. So again, four years just to walk there. And on the way, he visited India, Persia, and Afghanistan. Now, when he got there, he found out that the ruler of China was a man called Kublai Khan, Kublai Khan, who was the son of Genghis Khan. And Genghis Khan, uh, I don't know if you remember from a couple of weeks ago, he founded the Mongolian Empire, which is probably one of, if not the largest, uh, land empire that has ever been uh, founded in, in the world, in world history. So they were from Mongolia. They were really good at riding horses. They were really good at fighting on their off their horses as they were riding. Um, so he actually made friends with Kublai Khan, and he was able to live in China. He lived there for uh, um, 24 years. He did a bit of travel on behalf of Kublai Khan through to Vietnam and Burma and Tibet and Indonesia. And uh, he got very rich doing this, working for Kublai Khan. Now, as we can see, that's a map of the journey. And as you can see also, if you remember our map of the uh, the Silk Road, it sort of follows the Silk Road pattern that we saw in that map. You'll also notice that he travelled back a lot of the way via the ocean. And again, that's another thing about the, the Silk Road. Uh, it wasn't just on land. There was uh, large parts of it on the ocean as well. So really, we're, when we talk about the Silk Road, we're, again, we're not just talking about one road. We're talking about many different ways of, at the time, crossing the entire world. So as you can see, the red line is his journey through to China and his blue line, 27 years later after he got there, is that uh, ocean journey back. And he also travelled a bit on land at the end there as well. Um, okay, so there's a little bit more information about Kublai Khan. Um, Marco Polo described the palace that Kublai Khan in as a, a palace full of gold and silver. Actually, the walls themselves were covered in gold and silver. Now, with Marco Polo, you've got to be a little bit careful. He was known to exaggerate. What does that mean? Basically, he took a little bit of truth and he would expand it to make, make it sound more spectacular and amazing. So when we read what Marco Polo said about his journeys, we can take some of it as a truth and the rest of it we've got to sort of try to balance out to see maybe he was sort of um, making it sound a little bit more amazing and spectacular just for, um, just for entertainment. So I'm sure there was a lot of gold and silver around the palace anyway. Um, so Marco Polo worked for uh, Kublai Khan for many years. Um, I'm going to let you read through that. I'm actually going to post this 
presentation on Seesaw so you can look at it yourself in your own time. And as you can see, uh, uh, Marco Polo traveled south towards uh, Indonesia and Sri Lanka and other places. Borneo, Sumatra, they're in Indonesia. And Ceylon is, is what uh, used to be called, um, was the old name for Sri Lanka. And um, after he delivered a princess on behalf of Kublai Khan in, down to a, a place in Persia, uh, he, uh, he tr decided to travel home at last. Uh, now, Marco Polo had been gone for a long time. So remember, four years there, 27 years out in China, and then he made his way back. So he probably left a very young man and came back kind of old and, uh, well, maybe even Mr. Hammond's old. Who knows? I mean, that's pretty old. So anyway, he got, got back, but he was quite uh, wealthy, and he had all these amazing stories. Remember, no internet, no newspapers. News was – there was no news, basically. So when this man came back, uh, full of jewelry, full of riches, and had all these amazing stories. People were blown away. It's like, whoa, what is this place? Uh, now, it's, at the time, Venice was at war with another city in Italy, Italy called Genoa, and uh, Marco Polo fought for his city, Venice, on behalf of uh, the people of Venice. He was put in prison, and while he was in prison, he wrote the book The Travels of Marco Polo, Polo which was published in French, and had all those incredible stories. Here are some of those adventures that he talked about. Uh, including meeting China's ruler, finding white bears, which no one had heard of at that time, polar bears, um, black stones that burned, which we would probably think now is coal at the time. They didn't know what it was. And going to a place where winter lasted all night, and uh, or winter, I should say, and daytime lasted all summer, which we know happens up in the Arctic, up in the very north part. Again, at the time, nobody knew about that. They were like, whoa. Um, now. Why are we talking about Marco Polo? One, because he helped cement interest in the Silk Road. So a lot of other explorers started travelling after they heard Marco Polo's stories, partly because they wanted to know if all this was true and partly because they were so amazed they wanted to see it all for themselves. Not to mention they thought, hmm, good way to get rich. So they went off and did that as well. And it in included influencing other explorers like Christopher Columbus, who was, uh, who's uh, often got uh, congratulations for discovering America. Uh, as we know, America was discovered a bit earlier, certainly by the Vikings, for example, but he, he's been given a lot of credit for doing that, and it, it did trigger a lot of exploration. So I hope you like that little presentation about Marco Polo today. Uh, sorry, this week we're going to be focusing on maps in history and a little bit on transport, but I'll talk about that in a moment. Have a good day.